Eric should attack the lungs, but we know it attacks the gut. Why? Look around you, John. Too many people, too much dirt. Smell the air. It lives here, John, and it always will. The best we can hope to do is to try and help people. It must be something else. I know what you're going to say. It's in the water. You've been saying the same thing for years. If it's in the air, we should all have cholera by now. You could say exactly the same thing for your damn water. Maybe. But I just feel I'm right. Then prove it, John. Prove it. Snow sets out to do just that with the only tools he has. Logic and statistics. My name is John Snow. I, I need to know how long your husband was killed. He visits the homes of victims in a neighborhood called Soho. Did he eat any old fish or meat? And tries to find anything that sets them apart from the healthy. He then begins to plot his data on a map. And where'd you get your water from? The Broad Street pump. Where does your family get its water? What Snow was doing, what Snow really originated, Thank you. is the basic premises of an epidemiologist. He was looking at the contours and shape of an epidemic. His careful detective work reveals a compelling pattern. Virtually all Soho cholera victims got their water from a single well on Broad Street. Any progress? Perhaps. It is that damned well. Now we can start to save lives. The next day, municipal authorities surprised the Soho neighborhood by removing the handle from the Broad Street pump. Get the handle off, man! It's a victory for the persistent Jon Snow and the power of statistics. And once the pump was disabled, the cases fell like a skyrocket that was done. It was just over. I'll take that. Later, City officials discovered that water from the Broad Street well was contaminated with cholera germs from a leaking cesspool. What Jon Snow accomplished is now called surveillance and response, and it remains our best defense for combating any disease outbreak. Tracking the outbreak of disease, tracing it to its source, understanding the causal connections, these are still the basic tenets of public health. But while the principles of surveillance have not changed, the world has. There are five billion more people alive today than in Jon Snow's time. And on any one day, millions of them are in the air, making local outbreaks instant global threats. And much harder to stop than removing a handle from a pump. And risks once remote are no longer remote at all. They can be right now in your backyard, in your children's school. Today, an outbreak can spread with jet fast speed, as SARS proved in 2003. The disease emerged in southern China, leaping from bats to an animal called the civet cat, and then to people. It reached Hong Kong with its major airports, and within a matter of days, had spread sickness and death all the way to Canada. Healthcare workers who were initially clueless to its symptoms and lethality were exceptionally vulnerable. We did not know what kind of virus was uh, spreading in our hospital. Within one week, many of nurses were admitted. Then the liver, fever, cough, respiration distress, very fast. One of the nurses uh, told me that she feels like uh, one animal eating her, her, her lung piece by piece. She said it's very painful. New diseases like SARS are very painful and extremely dangerous because our bodies have no natural immunity to them. So keeping vigilant to their emergence and responding quickly to their spread is critical. 
For the most part, and thanks primarily to the World Health Organization, that happened with SARS. From the day it began spreading from this Hong Kong hotel, it took only seven weeks to identify the virus that causes the disease and trace it to its source in the wild animal markets of southern China. Although the outbreak caused worldwide panic, it ended quickly. Only 700 people died because the world mounted a coordinated global counterattack against this new killer germ. But those who were on the front lines cautioned that SARS was not so much a victory as a warning. SARS stressed and stretched the existing system that we had. In fact, it stretched it to the point of collapse. We were very lucky with this virus. SARS was a reasonably lethal bug, but it had a poor transmission rate. Now you take a bug with high transmissibility and high lethality, it's a global disaster. That's why alarms went off when people started dying from a rare strain of one of the most contagious diseases in the world. His name was M. He had just entered the first grade. M lived in Thailand with his parents and twin brother. When we took him to the doctor, we thought he just had a bad cold. But M's condition quickly deteriorated. One by one, his organs failed. Kidneys, liver, and as his body fought the infection, his lungs filled with fluid. He was taken to the ICU, and I never saw his face again. M had been infected with avian, or bird flu, one of about 150 cases so far in Southeast Asia. Over half have died, making this one of the deadliest germs on the planet. Worse, Experts are convinced it could easily evolve into a 21st century version of the most devastating flu that's ever ravaged the world. That flu struck during World War I and killed more people in just a few months than all who died in wars during the 20th century. More people died in that epidemic than any other epidemic in human history. 20 to 100 million people died of flu in 24 weeks. Many worried this was the end of the world as they knew it. People would get very sick very rapidly. In just a couple of days, their lungs would fill with fluid or blood, and they would basically drown in their own fluids. It was a really horrible and very rapid death. 92-year-old Marikita Mullen remembers the horror from her childhood. There were two people in our household who contracted it and died the next day. There were bodies stacked in the morgues because they couldn't get, bury them fast enough. What made this particular flu so deadly has been a mystery now for almost a century. Genetic researcher Jeffrey Taubenberger of the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology suspected he might find an answer to that mystery buried in the virus's genes. But where could he find a virus from nearly a hundred years ago? His search led him to an obscure government warehouse filled with box after box of tissue samples collected by U.S. Army doctors over the past 150 years. We really were looking for the genetic needle in a haystack. We knew that the chances of finding material would be really slim. Although millions died of the flu, Taubenberger needed to find a tissue sample with the remnants of the virus still intact. After searching for more than a year, he was still coming up empty-handed. But as we learned more about the pandemic, as we read more about the history and learned about the awful devastation, our desire to find a positive case just became so much stronger. We really needed to, to keep going until we had exhausted all possibilities. Finally, he found what he was looking for. 
this tiny slice of lung from 21-year-old Roscoe Vaughn. Private Vaughn was being trained as an artilleryman at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. He was 5'10", a little overweight, but otherwise healthy, until he reported for sick call with a fever of 103. Three days later, he was dead. Roscoe Vaughn's lung sample yielded a small fragment of the virus that killed him. Later, Taubenberger also found fragments from a soldier in New York and a young woman from Alaska. Eventually, he discovered enough to be able to sequence the entire genome of the 1918 flu virus. What we have from the sequence data and our analyses of these sequences suggest that the ancestor of the 1918 virus was a bird-like influenza virus. The devastating 1918 virus that killed over 50 million people was indeed a bird flu, just like the virus now plaguing Southeast Asia. Normally, a virus that infects birds doesn't infect humans. But the flu virus has a secret weapon. Influenza is really a quick change artist. It's sort of kind of a chameleon virus. It has the ability to mutate really rapidly. Different flu viruses can even swap genes, especially if they invade the same cell and take on new and deadly traits. Genetic evidence suggests that it took just a few mutations to create the 1918 flu. It began as a virus that only infected wild birds, such as ducks and geese. The first mutations probably gave it the ability to infect animals that people keep nearby. Another mutation enabled it to spread from these animals to people and one last mutation gave it the ability to spread human to human. The virus now killing people in Southeast Asia hasn't taken this final step yet, but many experts fear it could at any moment. Once this virus does acquire the ability to be transmitted person to person, which we believe is just a matter of time, it will unleash a pandemic, and within a matter of days to weeks, it'll be in every continent of the world. None of the population of the world have immunity to this. Everyone is totally susceptible. Uh, and, and so the death rate could soar. That's why Scott Dowell is keeping a close eye on cases in Thailand. He was sent here by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control to set up an early warning system for new diseases. Have we talked to the flu branch about that? He was on the scene when bird flu began heating up in late 2003, when large numbers of chickens here began to die. Thailand is home to a booming chicken industry with perhaps a billion chickens being raised at any one time. So when they started to die, the livelihood of the whole nation was under attack. Tests soon confirmed they were dying of a bird flu strain called H5N1 that was circulating in geese and ducks. So this virus had taken the first critical step, wild birds to domestic animals, that began the 1918 flu's deadly run. The Thai government tried to eradicate the virus by killing every chicken that might have been exposed. Soon, tens of millions had been sacrificed throughout Southeast Asia. But chickens kept getting sick. And then, people like M started coming down with H5N1. So the virus had now reached stage two, chickens to people. And it was as deadly as everyone had predicted. Scott Dowell knows every person infected increases the chance that this virus will move to stage three, human to human transmission. So finding ways to prevent people from catching the disease from chickens became an immediate priority. 
It was widely assumed the most likely people to become infected were chicken handlers. But that was wrong. You look down our line list of victims and it was a seven-year-old boy and a six-year-old girl and another seven-year-old boy and another seven-year-old boy. We wondered what was it about seven-year-old boys that were preferentially being infected with this virus. Like John Snow before him, Dal needed to find out how these children were being exposed to a killer germ. His team went door to door, asking questions and searching for something the victims had in common. How many chickens do you have? They soon discovered that the answer was literally staring them in the face. Quickly we figured out that 60 or 70 percent of the 65 million people in Thailand have exposure to backyard poultry. That's millions of people living with chickens that are susceptible to a deadly virus. And in the traditional distribution of labor within families, the bloody task of plucking chickens is often the job of young children. People didn't realize that that was a big risk to their children. The Thai government went on an education offensive, teaching people how to avoid infection. And deaths from the virus in Thailand plummeted. But elsewhere in Southeast Asia, isolated deaths continue. And H5N1 could still take the human-to-human -human leap that made 1918 so devastating. And this flu could be even worse. If we go back to uh, 1918, 2.5% of people died. How many people are dying with bird flu? 50%. We've never seen such an event since the time of the plagues. We intuitively don't believe it. You know, with current science, current technology, you know, this is not going to happen to us. Believe me, it could. From the moment the first bird flu case was identified, Robert Webster's lab has been trying to create a vaccine. So Ashley, what strain are we putting into the eggs today? This would be the best defense against this killer disease when it begins to spread person to person. But coming up with a bird flu vaccine presents some special problems. A yearly flu shot contains a weakened form of the flu viruses humans normally catch. These weakened viruses jumpstart production of the body's natural defenses, which can then defeat the real flu when it strikes. The virus for flu vaccines is grown in eggs, living embryos that are ideal for producing large quantities of vaccine. But with bird flu, there's a giant obstacle. This virus, as you know, kills chickens. It kills the chicken eggs. It kills the embryo. And so that is a problem. It's also killing the people infected. So people making vaccines are at risk. Webster and his team are trying to create a much safer version of the virus through genetic modification. They removed a part of a key gene that makes the H5N1 so deadly. They then combined the now weakened gene with another flu virus known to grow well in eggs. They hoped this safer hybrid virus would trick our immune systems into producing antibodies that could defeat the real H5N1. In early 2005, the vaccine was ready for testing in humans. So what are the plans for going to Russia? Let's talk about that. As Webster waited to learn how effective his vaccine would be, scientists in Russia brought news. H5N1 had been detected in wild birds in Siberia. The virus is clearly on the move, following the migratory routes of the birds. It's only a matter of time before virus transmits in through Alaska into the flyways of the United States. 
As the virus spread, so too did the urgency for finding an effective vaccine. That's why the news that Webster's vaccine worked made headlines around the world. The trials that have been going on are most encouraging. Until now, we haven't had a vaccine. Now we've got one. And in my opinion, we should begin making more of it immediately. We need to start stockpiling that. Unfortunately, the world has never produced enough vaccine to even protect us against major outbreaks of normal flu. In its best year, when all the planets have lined up perfectly, the world has never made more than 260 million doses of flu vaccine. Now, my math says that puts us pretty short, given that we have more than 6 billion people on Earth. Today, fewer and fewer drug companies are making vaccines of any kind. There is far more profit in drugs people take every day. And, since no vaccine is totally safe, there's always a liability concern. So right now, we can't produce enough vaccine to stop a global outbreak of bird flu. It's a bloody disaster, really. By 2006, there will be a limited supply of bird flu vaccine in developed countries. But who will get it? And what about nations that can't produce vaccine on their own? If we said our vaccine supplies, such as they were, were only for domestic use, and we would deny them to the entire continent of Africa, the entire continent of Latin America, we would face enormous flack after the bodies were buried. And we would be a much hated nation. And there's one more problem. H5N1 is constantly mutating. So it's possible that by the time it starts spreading person to person, the current vaccine will no longer be effective. Although a new vaccine could be made, it would take months. By that time, a hundred million people could be dead. So depending on vaccines alone to stop bird flu, especially in Southeast Asia where it is gaining momentum, could fail disastrously. That's why Scott Dow and other global health experts are developing ways of preventing an outbreak without relying on vaccines. The traditional view of an influenza pandemic is that there's a major change in the virus and it sweeps around the world in a matter of months. Do you have a surveillance form? We believe it's possible to contain, logistically feasible, to contain a pandemic at its source. But to stop a disease like bird flu from spreading uncontrollably, any suspected case will have to be identified and isolated immediately. So Dal is training surveillance teams to monitor all hospital admissions. If they detect a possible case of bird flu, blood is tested and chest x-rays are rushed off for analysis. Other teams would quickly scour a victim's neighborhood searching for and isolating anyone else with symptoms. Those infected and their contacts would get Tamiflu, a powerful antiviral medicine. Although the medicine doesn't prevent the disease, it reduces viral reproduction, making it spread from person to person less likely. What's going to happen in Nakwantanum, but in Sakao, this was a surprise, and this was... A but success will depend on speed and the resources to build a rapid response system. Something that the Thai government is attempting to do with Dow and the CDC's help. But many of Thailand's neighbors, like Vietnam, are nowhere nearly as prepared. Vietnam has had twice as many bird flu cases as Thailand, yet it has only a handful of trained people who can track the disease and no effective response system. Without more help, Vietnam has little chance of stopping an outbreak from spreading. 
This comes down to surveillance and the infrastructure and is the rest of the world prepared to put funding into countries like Cambodia, Laos and Vietnam? Is the rest of the world prepared to spend money on stockpiling drugs, stockpiling vaccines and so on? If not, bird flu could easily envelop the entire world, spreading even faster and wider than SARS and proving far more deadly. If that happens, the WHO will again take the lead in trying to protect us all. But they are vastly understaffed for managing a crisis like this. We're actually talking about a very small organization with a core budget of only $400 million a year, which is a whole lot less than most cities in the United States spend on public health in a month. To succeed, WHO will need help. And not just from countries on the front lines of this battle. What's needed is a whole new level of international cooperation. Avoiding massive human suffering from new and dangerous epidemics will require making a true global surveillance and response system one of the world's highest priorities. Nobody knows where the next big disease is going to come from. Nobody knows how quickly it's going to go global. All we know is that we're all in this together. And so we've got to have good surveillance systems in place and control measures so that we can stop it where it starts. You leave part of the form in the chart. We can do this. There isn't a single problem in global health that we don't have the means to deal with. It just requires commitment, human expertise, and resources. And if we apply those things, we can see a very, very healthy 21st century. En la actualidad, la humanidad disfruta de importantes procesos industriales que hacen mucho más fácil el desarrollo de nuevas tecnologías. Nuestra vida es más sencilla porque alguna vez alguien tuvo una buena idea. ¿Qué hizo la revolución industrial por nosotros? Los alcances científicos y tecnológicos del siglo XIX que modificaron nuestra forma de vivir. ¿Qué hizo la revolución industrial por nosotros? Los lunes a las 21.30. Por Encuentro. Yo con un lápiz y un papel, si alguna cosa tengo que decir, ni necesito productor, ni tengo pretexto. Y un buen guión debe permitir ver la película que soporta. El que tiene el derecho sobre la obra es el que la escribe. Ideas tenemos todos. 
Lo más importante es la reescritura más que la escritura. Uno escribe desde el corazón y reescribe desde la cabeza. Encuentro con Argentores, un ciclo de entrevistas con los referentes más reconocidos de la Sociedad General de Autores de Argentina, con la conducción de Mona Moncalvillo. Los lunes a las 22.30, por Encuentro. El tamaño y la edad del cosmos están más allá del entendimiento humano. Perdido en alguna parte entre la inmensidad y la eternidad, se encuentra nuestro diminuto hogar planetario, la Tierra. Encuentro presenta un viaje de aprendizaje a los límites del universo para descubrir el corazón del alma humana. Bienvenidos al planeta Tierra, un mundo que sin duda respira vida. Con la sabiduría acumulada de hombres y mujeres, obtenida a un alto precio a lo largo de más de un millón de años. La ciencia como arte, como poesía y motor de una humanidad en busca de su lugar en el infinito. Cosmos, de Carl Sagan. Los jueves a las 23, por Encuentro. Internet, la televisión en colores y el cable no existían en la Argentina. Hace 30 años se sancionó una ley que todavía sigue vigente. Una ley que contemplaba como nueva tecnología a la radio FM. Mi primera computadora fue una Commodore 128. Yo estaba en tercer grado, año 1990. Me compraron mis padres una XT usada. Actualizarla permitirá que todos podamos participar con nuestras voces e imágenes, haciendo de nuestros medios un lugar para todos. El proyecto de ley de servicios de comunicación audiovisual actualizará la legislación sobre las nuevas tecnologías, porque es importante tener una ley que se adapte a los cambios que estamos viviendo. Ley de servicios de comunicación audiovisual. Sumate al cambio. Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo les va? Le voy a contar este chiste para ver a la gente que le gusta. ¿Por qué fue a terapia el libro de matemáticas? Porque tenía muchos problemas. 